Good evening. I'm Dee Tedek. And I'm Roy Lister. After more than a year of planning, the time has finally come to welcome you to the Sixth International Conference on Immersion and Dual Language Education. Our theme this year is connecting research and practice across contexts. And we are so excited that you are here. <laughs> In Minnesota, we like to say that we have two seasons, winter and construction. <laughs> and that has never been truer than this year. As you can see, our construction season is still going strong, right out in front of the hotel, unfortunately. We hope that the stunning fall colors and the dry, warm days ahead that we've ordered up for you in some way compensate for the mess and inconvenience. And we hope you find a little time to venture out and experience some of the beauty of fall in Minnesota, because it is really quite beautiful. We also hope you enjoy the celebration in Minnesota that's evident in this hotel. For example, behind the hotel registration desk is a wall sculpt sculpture made of post-it notes. Post-its were invented in Minnesota. <laughs> and aren't they handy little things? Um, and the sculpture is actually the trajectory of the Mississippi River, whose headwaters are in the northern part of our state. So check out some of the detail that you see in this space to learn more about wonderful Minnesota. So this is our fifth Immersion and Dual Language Conference. It did go, thank goodness, um, uh, hosted by Carla at the University of Minnesota. The inaugural conference took place in 1995 with about 235 registrants and was followed by three others in 2004, 2008, and 2012. Based on interest to offer the conference more frequently and in different contexts, we passed the conference baton, so to speak, to Utah. And in 2014, the Utah State Office of Education, together with the University of Utah, invited immersion and dual language educators and researchers to Salt Lake City for the fifth conference. Utah folks, where are you? There they are. <laughs> Now we're pleased to welcome you back to Minnesota for the sixth gathering, for the first time in downtown Minneapolis, my city. <laughs> we have the largest crowd yet, 981 as of Monday when we cut off pre-registration. We, we suspect we may get in some walk-ins, so. <laughs> this increase speaks to the proliferation of these programs in the US and around the world as well as the growing interest of bi and multilingualism through immersion and dual language education. This shows you a little bit of uh, where our conference participants are from in the world. And we hope we haven't missed any countries. If we have, we apologize and hope you'll come and find us and let us know so we can add to the list. We also have representation from most states within the United States, and we welcome many registrants from our sovereign territories in the US. Thanks so much for coming. So we have an unprecedented number of registrants this year, and this main Great Lakes Ballroom, where our lunches and plenaries will take place, is simply not large enough to accommodate everyone. Therefore, we've had to assign several hundred people to a second ballroom. <laughs> Please check your name tags. If your name tag says North Star at the bottom, you will need to go to the North Star Ballroom on the second floor for both of the morning plenaries, both lunches, and the afternoon plenary on Friday, which is right after lunch. We will be streaming in video of the conference plenarists for the final plenary and conference farewell on Saturday afternoon at 4.15, we ask that you join us here in the main ballroom. We understand that it's not ideal to have to split registrants between the two ballrooms, but it was our only option. The alternative would have been to, st have st would have been to stop registration weeks ago, and that would, not, that would have been very disappointing for many, and especially for us. So we thank you for your understanding and cooperation. Please note also that given our record numbers, we're not able to replace lost programs. We ask that you please write your name in your program and keep track of it. If you have signed up for the dinner dance for Friday evening, you must present your ticket to get in. 
Tickets are with your name tags. They were inserted in your little uh, plastic pouches here. We're sorry we're not able to sell any additional tickets. We did have to confirm numbers for dinner with the hotel earlier this week. So thanks for your understanding on that end too. Okay, although I can honestly, honestly say that I'm all a Twitter at the start of the 2016 conference, I don't tweet. <laughs> but for those of you who do post tweets to Twitter, we have set up an account. So follow hashtag Immersion2016 to post your tweets and get the inside scoop in real time. Okay, we'd like to thank our sponsors very quickly here, our gold level sponsors, Caslon Publishing, the Shakopee Metawakatan Sioux Community, Adalingua, and the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota. And our silver level sponsors, John Benjamin's Publishing Company, the French Embassy of the United States, Global Programs and Strategy Alliance, and the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Minnesota. And our many university sponsors, as well as our partners, Utah Dual Language Immersion, Dual Language of New Mexico, and the Center for Applied Linguistics. We're so grateful to all of you for your support and your partnerships. Without further ado, we officially open the 2016 Carla Conference on Immersion and Dual Language Education. I'm so excited. <laughs> Told you. <ya. laughs> all right, we want you to say welcome in your language when you see it. Welcome to everyone. Welcome. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Meredith McQuaid, Associate Vice President and Dean of International Programs representing the University of Minnesota. Good evening. On behalf of the University of Minnesota, I would like to welcome all of you to the 2016 Conference on Immersion and Dual Language Education, sponsored by CARLA. Just to remind you, the Center for Advanced Research on Language Acquisition, a small but mighty linguistic powerhouse of the University of Minnesota. Among the many sponsors that were just announced, nine of them represent different departments and units of the university, including my own, which is the Global Programs and Strategy Alliance, and we are the proud home of CARLA. The GPS Alliance, as we are known, is the driving force for comprehensive internationalization at the University of Minnesota. And I don't need to tell anyone in this room that learning about another culture through language, acquiring competency to actually think in and communicate through a second or third language is an important component of this idea of comprehensive internationalization. The faculty and staff of CARLA necessarily work closely with the faculty and staff in our many wonderful language departments at the university to advance this cause steadily and completely. For those of you who don't know us, the University of Minnesota is one of the three most comprehensive universities in the United States. And by that, I mean we offer undergraduate, graduate, and professional degrees in virtually every discipline you can imagine, including all of the health sciences, law, and business, as well as all of the arts and sciences. We are sixth in the country for the number of students who have an international experience beyond our borders while they are enrolled with us. And we are proud to welcome students from more than 80 different countries every year to our campuses. Our faculty and staff are increasingly involved in cross-cultural experiences through research, teaching, and engagement, both at home and abroad. I'm really delighted to see so many people here from all around the world to join in a multicultural discussion about the many aspects of immersion education. I hope you enjoyed your visits yesterday to many of our immersion and dual language education programs. And I hope that your interest in being here, your curiosity about what and how immersion and dual language education is done in Minnesota has been sufficiently piqued by those visits. 
I trust that while you are here, you will all expand your network of like-minded people who share your interest in creating a multilingual world through language immersion education. But I want to echo Dee's encouragement to take your colleagues and your conversations outside into our beautiful Minnesota fall. If you can get past the barricades and the cones, <laughs> get to the Mississippi River, which is not too far from here, and take a look at what is often known as Old Man River. It is fresh from its start, just 200 miles north of here at Lake Itasca, where it begins its 2,552 mile path to the sea. And then you can compare it to the post-it sculpture in the lobby. The Mississippi River is a natural wonder, and of course it was an important resource to those who settled the Midwest well over a century ago. But travelers and tourists and international students still come from all over the world to see the Mississippi River, one of the world's major river systems. Samuel Clemens, through his pseudonym, Mark Twain, of course, wrote extensively about the Mississippi River. With respect to his own travels and those of his fictional characters, Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer, and Jim. His book of the adventures of Huckleberry Finn is known for its colorful description of people and places along the Mississippi and its sober and often scathing look at entrenched attitudes of the time, particularly racism. But Mark Twain wrote extensively about language as well, both the English language and the German language. It is he who said, I never knew before what eternity was made for. It's to give some of us a chance to learn German. <laughs> he also wrote that language proficiency is a more into important intellectual property than any other that human science can furnish. Your work to develop and deliver programs and opportunities for young people to become immersed and hopefully proficient, if not fluent in another language, provides exactly that intellectual property to which Twain referred. An intellectual property valued by many, indeed more valuable than any other that human science can furnish. Well, Minnesota is home to many other natural wonders, but it is also the home to many great people as well. It is my pleasure to introduce to you now one of those great people who will provide the official state welcome. Senator Patricia Torres Ray is a politician and member of the Minnesota Senate. Senator Torres Ray's district includes an area of Minneapolis and part of one of our large suburbs. She was not born in this state or even this country, but she met her Minnesota husband when he was a University of Minnesota student studying abroad in Columbia. These are the kinds of stories that we love to share with our undergraduates who worry about what will happen to them if they study abroad. <laughs> we often tell them, you will find adventure and you may very well find love. Now, it doesn't always work out that way, not the way it did for Senator Tories Ray, but here in Minnesota, we are ever so fortunate that it did. Senator Tories Ray had a long history of public service and community organizing before she ran for elected office. She had a great deal of experience building partnerships between agencies, tribal reservations, nonprofits, and other organizations that serve children and families. She has tutored kindergartners, and significantly for this group, she developed a bilingual book club of fifth graders. Senator Tories Ray is the first Hispanic woman to serve in the Minnesota Senate. She is a great friend to the University of Minnesota and understands firsthand the significance, the importance, and the beauty of learning more than one language. Please join me in welcoming Senator Torres Ray. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes y welcome. Bienvenidos. We are so happy you are here. And as I think about my coming to Minnesota and beginning to learn the English language, as I was listening to the introduction, thank you so much, Meredith. I remember the tough times, so this is a wonderful time to be in Minnesota. I am glad you came here and you didn't come in January. <laughs> 
there's a lot to do in January and we play in the snow, but this is the best time. Yes, I hope you get to go see the colors along the river. They are the best in the country. It is a beautiful time to be in Minnesota. And what a wonderful opportunity to really talk about the work that you do for our children, that you do for our communities, that you do for all of us. Uh, I came to this beautiful country really without knowing a word of English. So that was almost 30 years ago. And I found so many great opportunities in this beautiful country. But uh, the most important thing is that I found educators who wanted to give me a chance, who wanted to guide me in this process and look where they took me. Now I am a state senator and I, chair the state and local government committee, which oversees the budgets of all state agencies. So I have come a far, far, far way from where I began my journey, thanks to people like you. So I thank you for that. And so many children, so many stories that I could talk about, but the most recent story, I don't know if you knew that um, Justice Sotomayor was here a couple of days ago. And to welcome her, the group of attorneys who organized this event, who was uh, the Hispanic Bar Association, prepared a video for her of 12 stories. And these were the stories of children of immigrant families who came to this country with very, very little. And their parents were very clear about why they were taking this journey and why they were coming to the US. But was, there was something very similar about these stories, that they were all looking, pursuing opportunities, looking for opportunities, pursuing a better future for their kids. But this generation actually was told that they really needed to speak English, and that Spanish was not going to be allowed in their families. And so a lot of these individuals who really advanced very far in their education and really did what their families wanted them to do, did not become bilingual as children. Later on in their lives, they realize that they have missed an opportunity, that they have missed something incredibly big, not only that connection to the language, but that connection to the culture. So it was later in their lives that they began to look for opportunities to get back to learn the language. They attended college, they attended camps, and they are still working on acquiring Spanish, which was the language of their parents, the native language of their parents. So here we are right now with a group of hundreds of people who are trying to help us do just that, to really value who we are, to value this incredible gift that we bring to this country, and so many so right now, I am in a generation, we are in a generation where we have a better understanding of that. So many of my constituents, so many of my friends who came from, whose ancestors came from Germany, from Sweden, actually they didn't have that opportunity. Now their great-grandchildren don't have that opportunity. German is not part of the, of the language, of the communication that they use in their families today. And it's interesting because politically, we're in a different place today, talking about politics and what is happening right now with our presidential election. So many of my friends whose ancestors were from Germany and from Sweden, right now are trying really to capture the culture again and try to figure out how to connect to the families. And many of the children are traveling abroad to learn. They know they miss an opportunity for this connection and for maintaining the culture. So all of this political rhetoric that we hear from people really around against immigration, against immigrants, that say, well, you have to learn to speak English in order to achieve, in order to advance in this country. Well, guess what? We live in a global economy where a second language is almost required, talking about you know, the, all of the things that you're gonna see about these great companies that are, um, you know, situated here. Um, 3M, Cargill, General Mills are here in Minnesota. They are looking for bilingual people. 
Now they are looking for workers that can function today in Minnesota, but tomorrow they will be in Colombia. The after tomorrow they are going to be in Berlin. So you are the individuals today who are helping, helping us create this wonderful world that communicates, that connects, that brings cultures together. And as a legislature, I have another message. This is my message as a person, as an individual, as a mother. I remember quite vividly a couple of things that happened to me, really one, personally, when I came to this country trying to look for my first job, really thinking that I couldn't speak the language so I could really look for a job where I didn't have to speak. And that was my, cho my choice and actually I started in a company printing bottles and then you know, I realized that was not a job for me. I really needed to speak the language. I really needed to learn. That was one story. I moved on. But the better story was when my child, who was a kindergartner, who was attending an immersion school, went in and a good friend of mine, who was his teacher, his kindergarten teacher, came to Tomas and she said in Spanish, Tomas, viniste aquí? Porque tu mamá quiere que seas bilingüe. De ahora en adelante no vas a hablar inglés. <laughs> so he said to Tomás, he was five years old, he said, your mother brought you here because he wants you to be bilingual. So from now on, no more English. You have to speak Spanish. <laughs> now this is, this is true. Tomás really learned to speak Spanish. And of the two children, he is truly bilingual. So I owe that to Mrs. Guadarrama. Thank you, Senora Guadarrama. He took it very seriously. So I am going to place that in the context of a, le a legislator. When I took my child to an immersion school, it was my decision that I really wanted him to become bilingual and to stay connected to my culture, to stay connected to my family. I had that choice, and I made that choice. So many of our children do not have that choice. Parents are looking for opportunities that are not there for them. I would like to tell you that in Minnesota, a lot of the children that are going to bilingual schools where they offer dual language programs are families and schools where parents actually have that choice, they make that choice, and they want their children to be bilingual. Those schools happen to be located in some of the wealthiest districts in the state of Minnesota. Now here is the irony. The irony is that we have a significant number of children who are bilingual, for whom we need to work really hard to make sure that they continue to be bilingual. Those children go to some of the lowest income family, income schools in the state of Minnesota. So for them, we have a different label. They are ELL kids. We don't call them bilingual, and we don't look at them as looking for opportunities for dual education. The label that we put on these children are, are, uh, is a label of deficiency, a label through which we say these individuals, these families, need more. They cannot learn as fast as we need them to because his first language, his native, their native language, or the native language of their parents is not English. I have been proposing a new way of looking at this. I believe that those families and those children are one of the same. That these children and these families are pursuing exactly the same. They are pursuing a wonderful education that will open, open opportunities all over the world. That's what we are doing for both. I believe that that is what you are doing for both families and for both groups of kids. And so I would like to encourage you to help me think about how do we talk in terms of policy and opportunities for children, not through the label of deficiency, I think we are okay. <laughs> so what I would like to do to conclude is to invite all of you to be a voice for the children, a voice for the families and the parents who are pursuing these opportunities 
for dual immersion programs, for bilingualism, for opening global opportunities in the world for all children, whether they are children who live in some of the wealthiest districts or children who live in the poorest communities who already have a second language. I believe that we need to put a label of progress, a label of maintaining culture, maintaining connection, but more than anything else, this label of opportunity for these children. So I would like to also let you know that a lot of the resources that are now in place in the classroom for the ELL children are actually not being used for ELL children because we have depleted the classroom from resources. So we have what many of you know and understand categorical funding, right? So this is one of the categorical funding labels that we have for education is the ELL. We really don't have categorical language for ca categorical funding for dual immersion. I believe that we need to create that. And then we need to merge the two ideas. But we also need to make sure that when we invest in children to acquire a second language, to become fluent in more than one language, then that we use that language, that funding, and that resource to do just that. Right now, the money that we put for ELL children in Minnesota, for instance, is being used for other things, and we have no way to track that funding right now. Why? Because we, ca we have depleted other sources of funding, whether that is early childhood education, whatever funding is that goes into the classroom, we look at it as a one pot of money. So we really don't know what is being done to train more teachers, to recruit more teachers, to bring bilingual teachers to the classroom. In Minnesota, we have a problem. We are not, we don't have a pool of teachers that, that we need right now that are bilingual teachers. We're not investing in the programs that train our teachers. And I, I can name you a lot of other things that we need to do for bilingual education that is not in place. So with you, we can do more to expand the funding and the resources to support your work, to support the children that are in the classroom, but more than anything else, to really open opportunities for the children that are attending the schools right now. You opened that opportunity for me as an educator. You opened that opportunity for my children who are bilingual and they are attending college today and looking for opportunities to become perhaps educators, and I hope that they do pursue that. So thank you for being here. Thank you for looking for those opportunities for children. And please, let's do more together so that we can have more children connecting to the culture of their families and their communities. And it will be really, it will be a missed opportunity for me to say that in this election, in this moment. I hope you have been paying attention. It has been said that really a lot of what is going on and a lot of the misconception about what new immigrants and people have today about the election and who do they need to vote, why are they voting the way they do, is really due to the lack of education. So. Our children, I have been door knocking in communities where we have a significant proportion of Im immigrants. And they understand the importance of the presidential election. But what they don't get yet is the importance of electing the local people who will make these decisions about funding for the education of their children, for funding for opening opportunities for their children. And so we have an obligation to talk about what that means and to talk about the relevance of these decisions that we are about to make in the context of education and your profession and the opportunities that we open for our children. So I thank you for that and I thank you for the work that you do every day to educate all of us and to open opportunities. Thank you very much.